Welcome back to our, our lectures on uh, scientific workflows. And I'm picking up in talking about reproducible workflows. I broke this up because I spent a lot of time talking about version control and continuous integration. I didn't want this to end up being a really long run on video. So I'm gonna now dive into some of the other aspects of, what, of how to make reproducible workflows uh, in general, but particularly useful for forecasting. So one of the things that can make a, a workflow reproducible is this idea of literate programming. And we've already encountered literate programming because our markdown is example of literate programming. The idea of having documents that embed, uh, that allow you to mix uh, code with text and allowing, essentially allowing your, your reports and papers and, and other web pages and other documents uh, to be dynamically regenerated uh, and in a way that regenerates the figures, it regenerates the tables, it regenerates the statistics. And so we'll see that more and more this semester. But I wanted to kind of point out here's a, a, a cheat sheet for R Markdown. There's a lot of great resources for R Markdown. I would definitely recommend uh, folks take a and just go onto the uh, R Markdown website and go through a quick tutorial because there's a lot of features in there that that really save time and effort compared to the way you would traditionally write a report or a paper, the ability to embed uh, tables that regenerate themselves, figures that regenerate themselves, ways that you can control the nuance of that uh, in more detail. Uh, one of the things that uh, I let some folks know in response to their first couple hands-on activities are things like inline code, the ability to you know, write text and then have uh, you know, numbers show up in line in your text that are referencing things you calculated in R as opposed to just having code chunks. Um, cool. And kind of as we talked about in discussion, uh, that that sort of allows you to really uh, ensure, makes it a lot easier for, for a paper to be reproducible. It's also a lot easier to, to update papers. You don't have to you know, be cutting and pasting things. Uh, one of the other challenges to reproducible re research is that uh, it's pretty rare for um, any analysis we do depend just on the code we writ wrote. So, so uh, models and analyses frequently depend on external packages and external libraries. So, if I'm doing something in R, you know, I'm going to have I'm going to start installing R packages and. In, 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 an analysis could easily end up depending on dozens of different R packages. Uh, if we're thinking about things besides R, like uh, compiled C or Fortran, it gets you know, just as complicated with you know libraries that you depend on to, to do those compiled languages. Uh, and so the reality is that uh, if you think about this just from yourself, uh, one thing we find a lot in forecasting in complex analyses more generally is that workflows can break on us when those packages update. So, you know, we have code that runs and then, you know, you update your packages and your code stops running and it is so incredibly frustrating and it is so challenging when you want something, particularly in, in a, a forecast to be running automated and you wake up in the morning, your forecast didn't run because some package changed. Um, so packet managing dependencies, so tools for managing dependencies help you kind of keep a good record of not just what libraries and packages you, you did, but provide a, a, a code-based way to reinstall those and, and keep track of them. So, so this is saying beyond just having documentation that says, that writes down what version you do, have tools that allow you to manage those. Uh, for others, it's also, you know, I find that those dependencies can be really important uh, to being able to reproduce other people's work. And, and it's really hard to document those. It's really easy to miss details. And so using software tools that uh, manage dependencies is really advantageous. Uh, this box right here is just a snippet from the tutorial on one such R-based tool, R-ENV, which is an R library that allows you to essentially take a snapshot of the tools and libraries that you're using for any particular analysis and update those snapshots when those change or to roll back them to previous versions if you find that things stopped working and you want to go back uh, to previous versions of that environment and, and set it up in a way that you can you know, potentially share those things as well. Um, 
building on these ideas of managing packages in libraries is, is, is I think, even more sophisticated idea of, of virtualization. So virtualization has been around for over a decade now. And the, the classic part of virtualization is this idea of a virtual machine. And so a virtual machine was essentially thinking of it as a, as a box. And inside that box, you would have not just your code, but you'd have all the libraries that that code depends on, as well as the whole operating system associated with that. So a VM is really, truly self-contained. Like I could be running on my Mac, I might be running a, a Linux virtual machine that has uh, you know, a, a set of software tools and, and I'm, I can be sure that in the future, uh, everything that was done in that analysis is fully reproducible because I've, I have a snapshot of not just the code and the libraries, but the whole operating system, you know, is there. Um, and that, that's a really powerful uh, concept, uh, but it has had, it has two disadvantages that, that have come to light. One is uh, the size, you know, when you have to have a whole copy of your operating system, you know, a virtual machine for even a very simple analysis ends up being many gig gigabytes of, of size to download. And they also are slow uh, because you have not, they're not super slow, but you do take a performance hit because your host operating system now has to emulate the guest operating system. Uh, so you have an operating system running within an operating system. That's what virtualization allows, but it, it, it you know, maybe it's a five or 10% performance hit, but it, it, it's there. Uh, so containers, our more recent uh, technology, popular, the most popular version of that being Docker, that is trying to, to make this a little bit more lightweight by leveraging the host operating system more. So you have con containers or boxes that now have the, the, the code fully compiled, the libraries fully compiled. Uh, they kind of work out of the box, unlike dependency managers where you would have to you know, reinstall everything. These just everything's there and it works out of the box. Um, and they're smaller and lighter weight because they aren't bringing the operating system with them. And they're a very popular tool in software development these days because you can, can put different steps in analysis in different containers and string these together into reproducible workflows. You can also, for simple workflows, just have a snapshot and you can, there's a Docker hub that's analogous to GitHub where you can push containers up, other people can download them and reuse them and build on them. It's a really great way to ensure that, that yeah, you have that full reproducibility. Um, and, and just to, to make clear that the getting other people's code up and running is non-trivial. As, as an example, you know, my lab is in trying to work with NCAR's community land model for years. And I would say, you know, piddling with it on and off uh, for the past four or five years, we still have never satisfactorily been able to install and run uh, that model in a way that reproduces uh, the same results that uh, NCAR gets. Uh, yeah, it, it's an incredibly difficult thing to install complex pieces of software. And contain so containers are really ad advantageous. So the last thing I want to talk about in, in reproducible workflows is is the actual automation. So how to avoid having to wake up every morning and manually run your script in order to do your workflow. So one of the things that, one of the kind of classic tools that allows people to do this is a simple command line tool uh, called cron. And cron is, I call it an old school job scheduler because cron has been around for decades. It's, it's a part, you know, it was a part of Linux. And so it'll show up in, in Macs. And I think even, you know, newer versions of Windows that have a, a, a Linux emulation, you know, have this idea of, of you can set up a scheduler and just says, you can say, you know, every day at, you know, midnight, run this script. Um, and it is, it remains, even though it's very old school, it remains, uh, you know, kind of at the backbone of a lot of uh, automated workflows that you want to run on a calendar. You know, it's the way that uh, to this day, a lot of um, IT managers manage, you know, large clusters and large software systems. But just because it's old doesn't mean it's not useful, and it, it's pretty simple. Uh, another old school tool that um, 
is getting reused and reinvented is the idea of make. And there's different versions of make out there now, some more optimized for workflows. Make started as a build tool for, for software. So you know, I encountered it as an undergraduate when I took a computer science course as a way of saying, you know, you know, uh, you know, a C program depends on you know a bunch of different files that need to be compiled together in one project, and so Make tells you the order that things need to be built, and if you change this, you have to redo that, and so people build workflows now using tools like Make to say, you know, you run this script, and then you run that script, and you run this script. If this script is changed, then you have to rerun the things that come after it. So it kind of automates the dependencies. So like. We showed in an earlier slide, you know, file, you know, file zero, file one, file two, file three. You can put those in make and just at one command say, you know, make all, and it will it'll automatically rerun them in the right order. And if you change step four, it won't go back to zero. It'll start, it'll start at step four and rerun from there. So it's nice. Uh, we talked about continuous integration as a software development tool. Um, I've seen folks repurposing continuous integration. To do workflow development as well. So, uh, you know, when a commit is made to a repository, so maybe you're, you're set up so that you commit your data files to a repository, and so every time you commit your data, um, you rerun a workflow. Um, and and I know a lot of a number, a couple of ecological forecasters that really are running their forecasts using continuous integration. And then on top of that, there's these newer tools. Uh, such as OpenWhisk that are essentially container-based workflows. And they, they allow you to string together containers and make them either uh, clock-driven or event-driven. And so, you know, if it detects a file has changed, you know, the weather forecast has been updated on NOAA's server, that will trigger a, a container that downloads and processes the weather forecast, which will then trigger your forecast container, which will then trigger your, you know, your, your forecast visualization or whatever, and push something up to the, you know, a server. And it's nice that the OpenWhisk will also makes it easier to work in the cloud. So it, it's it's a more sophisticated tool, uh, less used so far, but I think the direction that things are moving. So that kind of wraps up um, the core of talking about automation. Um, I'm going to next move on to thinking about uh, best practices for scientific computing more generally. <laughs>